Thank you, members. And uh, it's now time for questions to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And I call Mr. Marcino Mueller. Could I, just before that question, can I inform members that questions 6, 9, 10, and 13 have been withdrawn? Mr. O'Mueller. Kesh Dehane, question number one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the civil service is committed to providing equality of opportunity and to creating an inclusive working environment where individual differences are valued and respected. A diversity champions network group was established in June 2015, with a senior civil servant as diversity champion appointed for each department. These champions have already met on two occasions and have developed a work plan for the coming 12 months. The work programme takes into account the restructuring of departments but will not wait for that to happen before actions are taken. As part of the work plan, each department has undertaken to promote diversity issues through its existing communication channels and to undertake specific diversity-related activities. The Diversity Champions Network has already commissioned research on representation of diversity groups within the NICS and their distribution across organisations and grades. We welcome this initiative. It is important that in serving all the people of Northern Ireland, the civil service is representative and has the best people using their diverse skills and knowledge to provide excellence in delivery. We believe that a good start has been made and that the work programme set out by Diversity Champions will move the civil service forward in a way that values our diverse and changing populations. Thank you. And I call Mr Mueller for supplementary. I want to thank the Acting First Minister for that reply. I want to endorse the efforts that are being made in that regard by our diversity champions across government departments, but also ask in the time ahead, could the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister look at expanding the idea of diversity champions into our arm's length bodies, perhaps into the community sector? And if we can't appoint those people, at least could we encourage their appointment and perhaps recognise the diversity champions who are out there? Thank you. I thank the member uh, for his question, and I'm sure it's something uh, that will be considered uh, in the office. I noticed uh, that just last week, actually, the Department of Employment and Learning, through their minister, was involved uh, in a, a scheme with various uh, organisations. Through uh, it was a diversity champions event hosted by Lloyd's Banking Group to try and encourage uh, employers to become involved uh, in diversity, not just leaving it to government to take the lead, but actually for the private sector to become involved as well. Uh, and of course, uh, when we think of diversity, it's right across all of those Section 75 uh, characteristics. Uh, but I do note that there's been particular mention. Uh, by the new Commissioner for Public Appointments recently on the need for more females uh, into positions of authority, particularly in relation to public appointments. Uh, we do recognise that there's a need for us to do that, uh, and I think all government ministers need to hear that very clearly, uh, because it is a role for ministers when appointing people to public bodies that they take into consideration uh, the balance and indeed the diversity in relation to those public appointments. Thank you, and I call Mr. Loris Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Acting First Minister how will success be measured? I think we need to look across where we, where we are at the moment, look at the evidence that's in front of us. It's not difficult. Uh, in fact, I think I have a, an Assembly question in a, at the moment asking me uh, what progress has been made over uh, many years. Um, and so we do need to look at the baseline and perhaps go back as far as the start of devolution and then to see what progress has been made uh, in relation to this issue. But I, I do say uh, uh, this to the member, I don't know whether she agrees with me or not, but there's a need for us also not only to appoint women when they come into the pool, but to encourage more women to actually put themselves forward uh, so that they come forward into that pool, because oftentimes when a minister is presented with a pool of candidates, uh, it is quite restrictive. Uh, therefore, we need to make sure that that pool is as wide as possible. Thank you, Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Acting First Minister for her responses so far. Would the Acting First Minister advise what consideration has been given to perhaps appointing a mental health champion? Well, obviously that would be at the first uh, stage a recommendation that would come forward from the Minister of Health. Uh, I don't know whether uh, the Department has had any thought in relation to that matter. Certainly it's something uh, that we would consider if such a, 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 a recommendation came forward from the Department. Uh, but as I understand it, no such recommendation has come forward. Thank you. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. 
both the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have given evidence to the Finance and Personnel Committee on this issue. I don't believe that I can profitably add to the information that has already been provided in this regard. I call Mr Nesbitt for supplementary. I thank the uh, Minister for that answer. As both Acting First Minister and also Finance Minister, could she tell the House whether she is sat satisfied she knows sufficient detail uh, about the NAMA sale? And if not, uh, what gaps in her knowledge she would like addressed? Well, all I can say to you is I obviously come into office uh, a, long term, uh, a long time after uh, the NAMA sale, and therefore I am relying on uh, the information that is brought forward to me by the Department, information which has been fully shared with the Committee of Finance and Personnel. As he would expect, I have been through uh, those various documents, and those now have now been shared. As I've said, um, my departmental officials have met with the National Crime Agency uh, in relation to this issue, and I am satisfied that I am aware of all the salient points. I asked the minister last week in her role as finance minister if uh, two former ministers should follow her lead and give evidence to the Finance Committee. I am asking her now if she will encourage Sammy Wilson and Simon Hamilton to give evidence to the Committee. Well, I have not given evidence to the Committee in relation to NAMA. I, I think he probably meant to say the First Minister has given evidence uh, to the Committee in relation uh, to the issue. Uh, as I said last week, uh, it really is a matter for the Ministers involved themselves. Uh, I think uh, as I understand it, they have been asked. I wasn't sure when he asked me the question last week whether they had been asked to the committee. I, as I understand it, they have been asked to appear in front of the committee. And uh, before they do so, I think they want to speak with the National Crime Agency to make sure that they are uh, sticking to the relevancy of the issue before the committee. Uh, and therefore, it will be a matter for them as to whether they go forward and give evidence. And I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the, the um, Acting First Minister, in light of the diverging narratives uh, from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister uh, of the events leading up to the, the Project Eagle sale, could I ask the Minister, who does she believe? <laughs> I think uh, the member has been rather mischievous in relation to that matter. His committee is engaged in uh, an evidence fact-finding uh, situation, as I understand it, although when one listens to the committee sometimes it is hard to get away from the suggestion that they have already made up their mind in relation to the outcome, and they are now retrofitting the facts in and around that. However, they are involved in an evidence-finding uh, situation, and therefore it is up to them as to what the outcome of their evidence finding is. Well, I do not think it is a matter for me to say who I do and do not believe. Let us just say the evidence has been provided to him. It is therefore up to him and his committee members to come out and decide where, uh, the, uh, where the issue lies. And, uh, uh, he knows very well what the situation is. Both the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have given their evidence to the committee. Uh, and therefore, it's a matter for the committee. Well, Mr. Jim Mallister. Up until May 2013, the First Minister and the Finance Minister contended that NAMA was playing a positive role in Northern Ireland. Then the First Minister's friends, Messrs. Krishnan and Coulter, arranged a secret meeting for the First Minister and the Finance Minister with PIMCO. And suddenly the First Minister was advocating the liberating of the assets through the sale of the loan book. What induced the DUP ministers to change their mind? Well, as I've indicated, I have nothing further to add to the evidence of the First Minister. And I'm sure that Mr Alistair listened intently to the evidence, and it was evidence, not opinion, but evidence that was given last week. Thank you. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Question number three, Speaker. The purpose of the Good Relations Indicator is to monitor progress in good relations here as a result of together building a united community strategy. The first baseline report under this policy was published on the 22nd of September 2015. It provides us with a picture of the current state of good relations. 
Future updates of the indicator report will provide us with statistical evidence on changes in good relations. It will allow us to make a strategic assessment of the progress made towards achieving outcomes in together building a united community, aligned with the four key priorities – our children and young people, our shared community, our safe community and our cultural expression. I call Mr. McRae for a supplement. Uh, would it surprise the Acting First Minister to know that the percentage of people who think that relations are worse now than they were, than they were previously uh, is at its lowest level since the Belfast Agreement? And why do you think that might be? Is it because of the Executive's failure to tackle contentious issues such as flags and emblems? Well, I think there's a, a wide range of indicators and uh, Mr McRae has picked out one which he thinks is very negative, but I actually think when you look through the entire indicators there is a positive trend in relation to the issues. Yes, there are ups and downs if you look at the trends from 2007, um, but I think the trajectory is going in the right direction. And yes, we will come across difficulties, and there have been difficulties over this past couple of years. He mentions the issue of flags. Uh, there was a particular issue in and around the taking down of the flag off City Hall, which led to a whole range of difficulties, particularly in, in the City of Belfast. And therefore, we have to be realistic that we have to deal with those issues. But I think if he looks at the trends overall, that he will see <coughs> excuse me, that the trends are going in the right direction. Thank you. And I call <laughs> Mr Declan McAleer. Could <coughs> you elaborate on what work has been carried out to date in attempting to bring down the so-called peace walls? Well, I know that this was uh, something that was set out very clearly uh, by the office as something that was needed to be uh, dealt with, but we have to deal with it in a very sensitive way because we are not just speaking in uh, abstract terms here. We are dealing with real communities who live beside uh, those walls, and therefore we have to work with those communities to try and deal uh, with the issues in front of us. And therefore, it has to be one of, and we have heard it a lot, of co-design, working with the different communities to make sure that if we are removing those walls, that it is something that everyone welcomes. Thank you. And I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Mr. Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for her answer so far. Can I, can I ask her what her assessment is of uh, the relatively high number of uh, racially motivated hate crimes? Well, uh, I have. Uh, uh, I was actually felt that the, in relation to the number of hate crimes, most were sectarian uh, in motive, uh, which still remains a difficulty for us here in Northern Ireland, as I'm sure he accepts. Uh, and the, the second largest were racially motivated. Quite a high number, actually. I was quite surprised. I shouldn't be surprised because there has been a lot of uh, coverage in relation to racial motivated crime. Uh, and I think it points to the fact that we in society need to deal with the sectarian issue, of course, but we also equally need to deal uh, with the issues of race and the fact that we do have, particularly in our inner city areas, uh, difficulties in surrounding and in, in actually integrating people of different races into our society. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Acting First Minister if she welcomes the inclusion of an indicator in relation to integrated education uh, in the new Good Relations Indicators, and whether that suggests a need to revise the Building a United Community strategy to include specific reference to the need to promote integrated education? Well, I think the indicators show, and I was very pleased, as he knows, I've been uh, heavily involved with shared education um, in Fermanagh uh, over a period of time. And I was particularly pleased to see the fact that a high percentage, I think it was in around the 80 percent mark, I don't have the figure just in front of me at the moment, uh, had been involved in sharing educational, whether it was through games or whether it was through classes. And so the communities are working together in a more cohesive way than when uh, he or I uh, were at primary school. And I I very much welcome that, and I think that will lead to the longer-term trends, as I say, going in the right direction. Uh, in relation to the integrated sector, of course, that uh, will be a matter for the executive as a whole, but I'm sure uh, we will take that forward uh, when we look at this good in uh, the indicators uh, at an executive, I hope, in the near future. And comes to Roy Beggs. Question number four. The implementation of the Stormont House Agreement is a fundamental part of the current talks process. As this round of talks is still ongoing, it would not be appropriate for me to discuss matters that are part of the negotiations. The member will be aware that prior to the talks, the parties had been meeting on a weekly basis since January of 2015. 
And during that time, good progress was made on a range of commitments, including those with which OFMDFM has responsibility. However, these could not be fully progressed until such times as matters relating to welfare reform are resolved. All aspects of the Stormont House Agreement are being considered as part of the talks process. <coughs> the document itself speaks of improving efficiency and reducing the burden of administration. Uh, and on the 2nd of March, there was an oral statement in, in the Assembly in which the Executive agreed to drafting an, a departmental bill and a more detailed transfer of function order. Given that we are now uh, approaching a period where there is a narrow window for new legislation in the life of this Assembly, can the Acting First Minister uh, update us as the progress of those important matters and when the extensive opportunity for this Assembly to consider and debate these issues will actually come about? Well, the member is absolutely right that a, a department's bill will, need, will be needed to be brought before the House to establish the future nine departmental framework and that a transfer of functions order uh, will then make the detailed provision for the statutory responsibilities which are to be moved uh, between the departments in consequence of the earlier executive decision. Uh, the bill has been drafted, the department's bill has been drafted, and prior to the introduction in the Assembly, and, and uh, detailed work on the transfer of functions order is also at an advanced stage. Uh, extensive administrative preparations for reorganisations are being taken forward under the site of the uh, Cross Departmental Programme Board. And so, for example, in my own department in DFP, I do know that we are now planning in relation to budgetary provision, uh, not for 12 departments, but for nine departments. So the administrative work has already begun in the different departments. The bill has been drafted and the transfer of functions order is at an advanced stage. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McGloan. Uh, question number five. The only formal programme under which we would receive refugees is the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. This programme aims to relocate those who are most vulnerable and resettle them in suitable locations where their needs can be addressed. Officials are currently making preparations to ensure that we are able to respond effectively to the needs of what will likely be a vulnerable group of refugees. Two groups of senior officials have been established to take forward arrangements. A strategic planning group led by OFM-DFM has been established to advise ministers on the response of executive departments and agencies and to consider the strategic issues at local and local implications. An operational group led by the Department for Social Development will consider and address the practical steps that will be needed to meet the immediate needs and longer term needs of those who may arrive under the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. The details of how the scheme will work here have not yet been finalised. The operational group is currently working to put in place arrangements to manage the arrival of refugees uh, through the scheme. This will include the provision of appropriate services and support to facilitate their integration. I thank the, the Minister for her response. Uh, based on my own sort of practical experience at at constituency level around issues associated with migrant workers. Uh, will the Minister accept that key areas of advice would be employment advice, health care advice, educational needs and in particular housing, uh, and that these matters should be, if you like, pivotal key elements of whatever advice and facilities are available for especially refugees? Thank the member for his question, and uh, I entirely agree with him. And it's for that reason that we established the operational group, which is being led by uh, the Department for Social Development in recognition of their role in connection with housing, um, because housing will be a huge issue for uh, these refugees. They will be incredibly vulnerable because we have decided to take the most vulnerable uh, from uh, the camps in Syria. Uh, they will need the most care and attention. And therefore, housing will be a key element to uh, the situation when they arrive here in Northern Ireland. So, DSD are leading in relation to that operational group, but as I understand it, uh, all of the other departments are feeding into that group as well. And uh, I call Adrian Cochran, what? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what if? What of any points of different success between the First Minister and Deputy First Minister with regards to this issue? Well, I understand that there are no points of difference. I know um, 
Some parties always like to look for points of difference between the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. I'm only in this role uh, less than six weeks, and uh, I realise that that is the case, but as far as I understand it, there are no points of difference between uh, the two gentlemen. Thank you. And the call is made. McLaughlin. Uh, good question, number seven, please. I am pleased to confirm that we have received seven proposals for the Shackleton site as part of the open competitive sale process. The sheer size of the site for sale is approximately 621.5 acres, so anyone who has submitted a proposal to purchase and develop a site of this size has demonstrated a genuine commitment to making a significant economic impact in the North West. We are now undertaking a, a detailed assessment of these proposals against the set criteria and look forward to this process being completed in early 2016. With Northern Ireland Water developing approximately 85 acres of the site and Darge relocation plans also well underway, it is a very exciting time for Ballykelly and the North West. Good, and I thank the Acting First Minister for her detail, and I welcome the, the seven proposals and the level of interest. But can I ask the Minister maybe just to give assurances that the amount of jobs and economic opportunities will be key to um, any decision around the sale of the site? Well, absolutely, and thank the member for her question. Uh, the preferred proposal, when it comes out the other side, will have gone through a very rigorous uh, testing uh, against the criteria that have been set and uh, of the criteria that have been set job creation the financial offer community benefit and environmental benefits uh, the highest weighting is in relation to job creation it's 45 percent of the weighting 35 uh, percent of the weighting goes to the financial offer 10 percent to community benefit and 10 percent to environmental benefits so therefore she can see from that weighting that job creation and the difference that it will make uh, to the area is key to deciding who uh, will be the successful uh, bidder and who will be able to develop the rest of the Shackleton site. Can I welcome the, the Minister's uh, response to the question? And she will realise that there is a lot of anxiety that this project will go ahead. Is the uh, Minister certain that the environmental assessment has been carried out? and at all issues relating to de decontamination, given that this was a former army site, are they all cleared and that in the future uh, we won't be embarrassed by any hold-ups? Well, certainly uh, it has been a rigorous process and, uh, as I have indicated, uh, the environmental benefits to the area will form uh, part of the criteria in deciding who the successful proposal will come from, and I think that is the first time that I can remember uh, such a weighting being put in, uh, and it is in recognition of probably the sensitivity of the site in terms of its environmental value, as well as, of course, its potential uh, in relation to the creation of jobs and the economic benefit for the area. Uh, I know that uh, there are many in the North West who have been waiting a, for a long time for this to happen. Uh, I can understand why they would wish it to happen. Uh, more quickly uh, than perhaps it has been in the past. But I, I, I say to the member, uh, we're hoping that the process will be completed by early 2016, uh, and then we will be able to move on to have that actual development take place. And uh, hopefully, it will be a very good news story for not just Bally Kelly, but for the whole of the North West. So, Chris Little, question number eight. Which I don't have in my. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, we welcome the committee's report, and since the launch of the Together Building a United Community strategy, we have engaged with a range of stakeholders as part of the detailed design of the many actions being delivered. We greatly value the input of all the stakeholders that engage with us in the design of good relations work. Our stakeholders have a wealth of knowledge and expertise that we will continue to draw on in shaping and implementing our policies, actions, and commitments. Co-design has provided an opportunity to engage with our stakeholders, including the people directly impacted upon by the headline actions. There has been extensive co-design for headlines actions, including the summer camps and the United Youth Programme. This engagement has been instrumental in shaping the way forward for both and has involved a wide range of stakeholders, in particular those young people the actions are aimed at. 
The establishment of the thematic subgroups under the auspices of the ministerial panel are key for engaging with stakeholders within the sector. Through this, we will ensure that their input informs how action and commitments are being delivered. It is important to continually seek to improve communications and engagement with stakeholders. Currently, the Department is in the process of looking at the establishment of a quarterly engagement forum for stakeholders to receive updates on Together Building a United Community. They will provide feedback to the Department on strategy, including progress, issues, identification of best practice and areas for improvement. And that was a very impressive recovery, saying he didn't have the paper in front of you. <laughs> Can we call Chris for a supplement? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Acting First Minister uh, for her answer. Uh, would she agree that the creation of a forum to harness the collective ingenuity uh, from people across sectors in our society, such as leaders in business and the community voluntary sector, uh, could help and enhance the design and delivery of the Building a United Community strategy? I thank the member for his question. And, uh, indeed, uh, the Department has been looking at that recommendation in relation uh, to uh, a TBUC forum um, chaired by a representative from the sector. Uh, we have been uh, working with the Community Relations Council uh, to try and make better use of existing fora uh, that it already has uh, in place. And, uh, one of the proposals being examined is to reconstitute the Interface Community Partners Forum uh, into a group that will help to further enhance engagement with stakeholders across the four key priorities of TBRC, and uh, we're continuing to work uh, in that respect. In other words, uh, to answer the question succinctly, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we believe that there are already uh, representative bodies there uh, that we can make use of, and we don't want to overburden people by setting up yet another forum, if, if indeed we can make use of the fora that are already there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for answers so far. Um, can the Minister provide us with an update on progress on uh, implementation of shared neighbourhood projects following the success of the Ballon of Foy development in South Belfast? I do not have uh, much of the specifics in relation to that issue in front of me, so I'm, I apologise for that. But certainly, the shared neighbourhood aspect uh, is one that is very key to the development of TBUC. It is one that we will uh, want to pursue and want to see working in reality on the ground. And we had a question uh, earlier in relation to the peace walls. And, uh, what we want to see is less of the peace walls and more of the shared communities. And that is why TBUC is determined to move ahead in relation to that part of the strategy. And uh, Mr. Jerry Kelly is not in his place. Ms. Sandra Overend is not in her place. If you're t -t and Ms. Judith Cochran is not in her place. And that means we've come to the end of listed questions, and we're moving directly to topicals. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In her role as Acting First Minister, uh, can the Acting First Minister advise us if she has had? Uh, a detailed briefing from the National Crime Agency into their investigation into the NAMA affair, which does encompass meetings uh, involving the First Minister and indeed the operations of OFM DFM. No, I have had no uh, briefings from the National Crime Agency. Uh, in the Department of Finance and Personnel, my permanent secretary has had uh, direct engagement in relation to the issues that the member mentions, uh, but I have not received. Uh, such a briefing from the National Crime Agency. The, the public uh, could easily understand why it may not be appropriate uh, for OFM DFM to have uh, detailed briefings into this uh, affair, given uh, the, any role that they may have played. But could the Acting First Minister explain why the First Minister met with potential bidders in a private meeting without departmental officials uh, to provide a degree of scrutiny and transparency? Well, as I have indicated in my previous answer in relation to this matter, both the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have given evidence, uh, quite full evidence in particular in relation to the First Minister. All of those issues were covered at that time, and I am sure if the member wishes to, he will be able to read the evidence of the First Minister in relation to those matters. Thank you. And call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Good, uh, John Corley. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the, the Minister if uh, uh, 
um, any um, financial appraisal was carried out of the potential sale of the Northern Ireland uh, portfolio by NAMA, if, if such an appraisal was carried out by her department before the sale took place? No, I don't believe such an appraisal uh, did occur. <coughs> that being the case, um, on what did the, the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and the former Minister of Finance base their view that the sale of the Northern Ireland portfolio to Cerberus was good for Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, uh, the sale was not uh, a matter for DFP. Uh, it was a matter entirely uh, for NAMA uh, as to whether, how they proceeded. As the member knows, uh, it's a matter uh, that um, was for them and them alone. In relation to the First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, the Finance Minister at that particular time, uh, at the risk of sounding repetitive, uh, Mr. Speaker, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister has given evidence uh, to the Members' Committee. I am quite sure that the Member had an opportunity to question the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister in relation to those issues. Uh, and I am quite sure if the Finance Minister at that time comes before the Committee, he can ask him a similar question. And I call Mr. Adrian Cochran Watson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister agree that it's important if the panel assessing paramilitary activity has evidence that it will clarify if the IRA still exists? And is that an issue for the Minister and for the DUP? Well, I'm here to answer as First Minister uh, on behalf of the First Minister, uh, and therefore I will answer in that capacity. Of course, we look forward to the panel's report. Uh, it is something um, that uh, my party pushed for in relation to this matter. It's an issue, I believe, that will inform the talks that we're all so heavily engaged with. Um, unless the member has a prior sight of what's in the report, I certainly don't, and I look forward to that report. I hope this week coming forward so that we can then move forward, I hope, in a positive way, and I'm sure he wants to move forward in a positive way as well. Mr Cochrane Watson for supplement. Of course I want to move forward. In public statements, the DUP have focused on what the IRA is doing, whether and whether or not it does exist. So can the Acting First Minister confirm that the existing existence of the IRA is not a problem for the DUP? Well, I'm not going to confirm a negative, if that's what the member wants me to do. Uh, of course, if paramilitary structures are in place, uh, that is an issue that will have to be dealt with. And it's an issue, I have to say to the member, that is not just uh, for the Republican community, but also for the Loyalist community as well. We have to deal with paramilitarism right across the piece in Northern Ireland. There are many communities still in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, uh, where it appears as if those structures are still in existence. And despite the fact uh, that we have had a long period of time uh, under which those structures should have uh, disappeared. They have not, it appears, disappeared. And therefore, we have to deal with that issue. And we will wait to see what the panel brings forward tomorrow. But if the panel says that those structures are still in place, we will need to look at how we can make sure that they come to an end. And that certainly will be the focus for me and for my party. Yeah, and before I call the next question, and Mr Cochrane, before you leave us again, uh, your question actually directed the minister who was speaking as a minister to a party position, and I think that members should be aware that that, in fact, is an abuse of the facility for questioning ministers on their brief. Can I just put that point before I move on to Mr Fergal McKinney? Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, and can I thank the minister? The minister will be aware of the High Town Waste Incinerator uh, uh, planning rejection, and also that money had been set aside, or at least set apart for that if it were to go ahead. What options are now being considered for that financial transactions capital? Well, the member is correct. Uh, £50 million uh, pounds was set aside in relation to financial transactions capital for the ARC 21 uh, incinerator. It is now being communicated to me in my role as finance minister that the department is no longer in need of that financial transactions capital and therefore, despite the fact that it's late in the day, we will have to f try and find, first of all, by looking across departments and then by looking at the Northern Ireland Investment Fund as to whether we can uh, use that money. We certainly don't want to hand it back. We want to be able to use it here in Northern Ireland. <laughs> 
And there's a point, another point, if I can make it, because I don't know what your supplementary is going to move on to, but uh, we're speaking today to OFM-DFM, questions of OFM-DFM. I don't want any confusion between an overlap in the Finance Ministry, as a couple of questions have uh, tempted the Minister, who has avoided the temptation. I, I, thank the, I thank the Speaker, and I hope by my supplementary I am not uh, frustrating his attempt for clarity on the issue. But this would involve uh, major decisions and at executive level, and would involve the Office of the First and First Deputy First Minister, in, in my humble opinion. Um, so, uh, the Minister might be aware of plans for the Cancer Centre in uh, South Belfast, though I would see the benefit of, of any uh, expansion there uh, uh, much more regionally. Uh, is her and all of the departments uh, discussing the potential for financial transaction capital in that regard, given the economic benefits that we had, the health benefits that we had uh, uh, with linking academia, health and uh, pharma. Well, certainly, if there's a way that we can use uh, even a part of that £50 million um, for a new cancer centre, or the, sorry, the extension of the cancer centre um, in Belfast, because it is, of course, uh, a regional hub for the whole of Northern Ireland, uh, I would be more than happy and more than sympathetic to hearing that argument. Um, as I say, we will be talking uh, to the rest of the departments to see if they have any requirement for financial transactions capital. Um, I, I do have to say to the member, though, it, we have been disappointed with the way in which departments have looked at this. Um, they, it is a new way of um, funding capital projects in Northern Ireland, I accept that, uh, but I am hoping that in the future we will see more take-up uh, from a public-private partnership in trying to use that money, uh, which is money that can make a real difference, and we've seen that um, through the use of the financial transactions capital at Ulster University, the way in which we were able to use it there, and indeed through many housing schemes as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Acting First Minister how, for her assessment of this government's performance during this mandate? Well, I think we have made a number of very important um, uh, developments in terms of strategy and in terms of delivery, more importantly. Uh, when I think of the fact that over the programme for government period we have delivered 37,000 new jobs to Northern Ireland against a target of 25. We have bypassed our targets in, in relation to uh, investment in Northern Ireland from outside of Northern Ireland. We have bypassed our targets in relation to the amount of money that has been put into research and development, bypassed our targets in relation to the amount of tourists that are coming here to Northern Ireland. So while some in this House may want to talk down the achievements of devolution, I think we have made uh, an impact on the lives of people living here in Northern Ireland, and I hope that we can continue to do so. Callister for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I did mean to uh, offer an apology for I think it was two weeks ago that I missed, missed a question. Could, further to that, can I ask the, the acting first minister? And I, I think though she's, she's uh, named some successes, I think it would be uh, you need to be living somewhere else to not say we've significant problems. Does she accept that? When we come back after the next election, presumably next May, that we cannot come back to the same level of dysfunctionality and zero decision making as we faced in the last mandate. The next mandate, does she agree with the point the next mandate truly must be about delivery? Well, the next mandate should be about delivery, and that's one of the reasons why the programme for government uh, will now be looked at from an outcomes based um, process instead of just setting targets. We're going to look at what impact will that particular action have on the people of Northern Ireland, and I think that's right. I think our focus on outcomes is the way we need to go. I, I do think he's been. Um, <laughs> rather downbeat in relation to zero decision making. There is some decision making still happening uh, and I think he knows that that is the case. And uh, things are still happening in Northern Ireland and I was delighted to be in the North West, for example, on Friday when we uh, opened, uh, the Deputy First Minister and myself, uh, part of the Ebrington site to uh, a cluster of new digital companies that are making a real difference in that area, creating jobs, using the digital infrastructure that we put in place, the devolved administration put the um, 
uh, digital infrastructure in place. And now, uh, because of the development at that Everington site, we're seeing real jobs being created. So I suppose it depends on whether you see the glass is half empty or half full. I prefer to talk about the positive impact that we are having on the lives, not taking away from the dysfunctionality that we have run into at the moment, but you know, isn't it good that we're talking about that dysfunctionality and trying to find a solution uh, rather than walking away from dealing with the issues in front of us? And I call Mr. Jim Allister. Thank you. Since being appointed Acting First Minister, uh, the Minister has affirmed that our partner Sinn Féin are inextricably linked with the IRA. If the panel report confirms that IRA members murdered Kevin McGuigan, is the Acting First Minister nonetheless ready to sweep that murder onto the carpet and resume business as usual? Uh, well, uh, you know, there's so many ironies in that statement that it's incredible. Uh, he and others did not support us when we tried to make sure that we did not have business for usual, as usual in this House. And yet, uh, when we don't have business as usual, we're criticised. And when we do have business as usual, we're criticised. So people need to make up their mind as to what they actually want. Minister, for a supplement. Well, perhaps, perhaps the Minister could try and answer. Uh, and let me say I, I would have more than supported the First Minister if he had done the proper thing and resigned rather than the hokey cookie option which kept Sinn Féin in government. But the choice is this. If the IRA murdered Kevin McGuigan, then dress it up as you like, massage it as this report may. The Minister has a choice to make. Is she going to resume full political cohabitation with Sinn Féin that she says is inextricably linked to that killing machine, the IRA? Well, I'd prefer to wait for the panel to actually report before I make up my mind. But, you know, Jim doesn't have to do that, of course, because Jim has made up his mind already. And that's the reality. And the fact of the matter is this. Mr. Alistair has always engaged in wanting to direct this assembly. And even in his supplementary question, he made the point that he would have much preferred if the First Minister had resigned and walked away. And what would that have meant? That would have meant the end of devolution. And wouldn't that have suited Mr. Alistair? Wouldn't that have suited Mr. Alistair that the people of Northern Ireland didn't have a devolved government? He has exposed himself again that he is on a records charter and he should wait and see what the panel has to say before making up his mind. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for her answers thus far. Can I ask her um, what her assessment is of the, the benefit of the re reduction of corporation tax now, given that corporation tax in uh, Britain is being reduced uh, overall? I think the uh, benefit of having a reduction in corporation tax still stands. Uh, I think actually the fact that the Chancellor has acknowledged the impact of having a lower rate of corporation tax strengthens our hand in relation to going out and selling Northern Ireland as a place to do business. It actually reduces the cost to our block grant, so that's a good thing, but it still gives us that marketing edge, I believe, when we go into companies that heretofore we haven't been able to go into because they wanted to talk about tax and we didn't have the advantage that I think we would have if we had a lower rate of corporation tax. So I absolutely think it is still the right thing to do. Order members and time is up. Thank you, Minister. The next item of business